Hi, welcome to Holster Life. A little bit of a different feel this evening. I'm not in my shop. So hopefully the lighting and the Wi-Fi is okay here. Uh, tonight is the follow-up to CNC part one. I'll keep my feet off the table so I don't shake the camera. Um, and I'll be talking more about some applications for CNC, how I use it in my business, what other shops that are thinking about getting CNC for holster making should think about. And then you can admire some nice artwork in the background. So uh, if you are a holster maker, a Kydex shop, goodness, please post your company name in the comments so I can see who's who. Hello, Jessica Hazelar. Thank you for joining me. Appreciate you being here. This little, this is not my usual stand, and so it's a little bit janky. Hello, John Hopman. All right, there we go. Leaving it alone after this. So, uh, first thing, I usually start with a tool tip. Here's a quick one. I use these a lot for simple CAD work. Uh, these are radius gauges. I'll hold them up so you can see. On one side, you've got uh, outside curves, inside curves. Um, you can get sets of a couple different sizes. I use the uh, large and small sets pretty often. The small set covers up to one quarter inch, and the other set goes, I think, up to half inch from there, yeah, up to half inch. Uh, these are Minatoyo brand. Uh, you can do an awful lot of good CAD work on pistols, just getting good measurements with digital calipers, and then working from there with angle gauges to get any remaining measurements you need. Hello, Clark. Hello, Kyle. Hello, Jeremy Gibbs. Thank you for stopping by. I, uh, I have to do double duty and watch some kids tonight. So, hello, Nick. Blade Riggs is in the house. Thank you for joining me. So, uh, this kind of tool is a simple and consistent way to get a ballpark measurement on radiuses like uh, the radius, the fillet on a trigger guard, the radius on the corner of a slide, things where you can sort of ballpark the measurement but you need to be close enough that the fit needs to be pretty exact. And so you actually, you know, just any of those outside radii on a gun, you just take one of these curves, lay it on the edge, sight it against a light source, and then select which one, whichever one fits closest, and then you can adjust slightly from there in CAD, either direction, larger or smaller, uh, to get what you want. Hello, Gary Larson. Hello, John Keller. Hi, Tony. Thank you for coming over. Um, I'm sorry the lighting here is kind of bad. I've just got one LED bulb in the ceiling, so it's, I feel like I'm getting blazed and whited out. So that's the tool tip. Radius gauges are totally worth the money to have a set. You can sometimes buy them loose in a package. I much prefer to have them uh, keyed in order in a holder. It makes it much easier to uh, keep track of them and then work logically from large to small or smart, you know, work through sizes as I'm trying to find what the radius on a physical part actually is. Hello, Lee. Hello, Mike Sedlicek. John is right. The place is hopping. Uh, so the initial video on CNC, I covered some basics of CNC, some ways that I used it in my shop. Tonight, I wanted to focus on uh, starting with fixturing, different ways of fixturing holsters. I touched on it briefly in the last one. I wanted to cover it in more detail now and explain some principles and what some of the trade-offs are for different kinds of fixturing. And then talk about uh, nuts and bolts of when and how a holster shop should consider getting into CNC. What kinds of jobs, what kind of business, what kind of space, what kind of power requirements, what the nuts and bolts are for when a shop is ready to go into CNC and when they're not. And you know, if you want to get ready to CNC, what are the steps to get you to that place? So, starting off with fixturing. Um, fixturing is a very, very broad category. And if you actually watch machinists on Instagram, which I highly recommend, if you're interested in CNC, watch uh, Kamal Alpay, Kalpay, K A L P A Y. Watch Andrew Kistner at Frontline Fabrication. Um, there's a whole bunch of guys I'm blanking on their handles because I, I know their names. Um, if you watch machinists on Instagram, one of the fascinating things is tons and tons of the artistry, the creativity, the problem solving, it's not in the cutting, it's all in the fixturing. 
how you hold the part, how you get access to the part, how you give yourself the most consistency with the most speed, that's all in fixed string. Fixed string can make or break the cost effectiveness of doing CNC for a process. Um, when I'm doing plastics, when I'm doing trimming in my brother's CNC, which is a very fast mill, um, oftentimes my cycle times to trim a pair of parts are at or under a minute 20, which is, you know, that'll involve at least one, sometimes two or three tool changes for a couple different size bits, drilling some holes, doing some other stuff, still under a minute and 20 seconds. If it takes me 30 seconds to unload the parts and load the parts back in, a significant percentage of my overall cycle time for each pair of parts is just the fixturing. Okay? If it took me one minute to cut the parts and two minutes to load and unload the parts, it's really not, it's not ideal. Hello, Jefferson Brooks. Hello, JR. Um, yeah, Skyler, I'm in the house. I'm not in the shop tonight. I got a couple of sleeping kids and my wife is out of town, so I've got to keep an ear out. Otherwise, I'd be out in the shop. Uh, maybe some of you didn't know that. My shop is on the same property as my house, which is really nice. Uh, it gives me flexibility in my work. It also makes it really hard to not come in and take breaks because you know my, my wife is here, my kids are here, home is here. Um, so working near home or adjacent to home has pros and cons. Um, so here are a few of the common ways plastics, especially thin plastics, present unique challenges when it comes to fixturing because they're not very heavy and they're not very stiff. Um, when, you, when you're clamping a big chunk of steel, you can just put it in a vise and you can crank the vise down and the steel is not going to deform or flex or get out of whack at all. Hello, Jared. But you can't clamp plastics without distortion sometimes. Jefferson, it, it's got pros and cons. I like it, but I think probably in the next, with it, certainly within the next year, um, I'll be moving the shop and separating it from the house just because I want a little more, um, I just want a little more separation. I want to be able to have actual, an actual work home balance, not a work home integration. Yeah, let's cut some steel. Why would we cut steel, Jared? Um, Nice when you can use 10 steps to the back door, out of the back door. Yeah, Jared says working from home is terrible. It really, it, it has major pros and major cons. The pros are no gas, no commute time, really easy to deal with. You can take breaks and have meals at home with your family. The downside is it's really, really hard to keep work separated and to actually have large chunks of undisrupted time where you can simply focus and work and work and work without kids trying to like sneak into the shop. Um, and also, yeah, it's really hard to leave your work and come in and be with your family when your work is so close. You can think about it, you can see it, you can go there in 30 seconds and do something. And so in some ways, it's actually easier to spend time with your family when work is farther away. You actually physically leave the location, you come home, you're not in the shop anymore. So. It has pros and cons. One of the other pros is usually the cost of having space close to home is less than renting a separate property or a separate building someplace else. But back to fixturing. So when you have thin plastics, you have to find a way to hold them down and hold them still to keep them from chattering and moving when you're cutting through them. And there are limits on how you can clamp them because the material itself is so flexible. So uh, a few basic things. You want to support the part. You want to have as little unsupported plastic as possible because if you have plastic that's not touching the fixture, that gives it the ability to move up and down and you're much more likely to have it chatter. If you have, um, if you just have indicator holes, a couple of pins that locate your part, but the 3D holster shell is laying on a flat surface and you're cutting it, it's more common in that situation to have issues with the plastic vibrating with harmonics and you know, the, the rotation of the bit causing things to move and you can end up with a poorer quality cut of poorer surface finish on your plastic. I do all my trimming in the CNC with purpose-built fixtures that are machined to match the initial forming mold so the part basically snaps into place and every surface of the part is fully supported when I cut it. And that allows me to go faster 
and it also keeps my surface finish more consistent because certain parts of the cut when you're trimming holster shells are harder than others because anytime the Kydex dives off an edge, when your bit's traveling along and hits that vertical edge, just for a second, it's cutting through the Kydex in this orientation, not in sheet orientation. And so you get a momentary sudden increase in load that then drops away. And when that happens, it's much more likely to have poor surface finish, chattering, and movement in the part when you're making transitions between contours in the part when you're trimming. So, um, three basic categories to think of when fixturing. You can fixture with a vacuum or you can fixture mechanically. Mechanically is clamps, screws, etc. Plastic is non-magnetic. You know, a lot of machine shops use magnetic fixturing if they're working with ferrous metals that you can actually use magnets on. We can't do any of that with plastics. Uh, although you conceivably could make uh, a counter call that's on top of the plastic and magnet it to a base and pinch the plastic in place. Sounds complicated to me. Your kids don't sneak, says Mike. They just barge in. Jeremy Gibbs says that moving the shop out was good for the family. I can totally understand that. Um, if you're fixturing mechanically, then you have the option of fixturing inside the perimeter of your final part or outside the perimeter of your final part. There are advantages and disadvantages to each one. Fixturing inside the perimeter of your final part usually means you either have to do two machining operations or you have to pause in the middle of a machining operation or you have to do manual drilling. So let me give you an example. If I'm going to trim a Glock 17 shell and I've got two eyelet holes under the trigger guard on each side and I plan to use those as my fixturing points, I'm going to put 832 machine screws with washers through the holster shell and hold it down to the fixture so I can cut around the entire outside perimeter in one pass and cut away all the excess and not have to lift the bit up and leave connecting tabs. I can just one trim, done. If I'm going to do that and I need those fixture holes, I either have to pre-drill them manually before I take that part to the CNC or I have to put the, the sheet on the CNC, run an operation that drills those holes on the CNC and then pause the machine, put my screws in, then resume and have it go do the trim or I have to take all my parts and do a drill only cycle, which is what I often do if I'm doing a lot of parts. I'll do two completely separate operations. I'll run all the parts through and drill all the mounting holes that I'm going to use for fixturing on the second op when I trim. I'll cycle all the parts through, drill all the holes, then call up a new program, and then I'll fixture the parts through those holes and put them in and trim them and keep running parts through and trimming. Um, if you fixture outside the perimeter of the part, you can drill all your holes and trim all in one operation, but you can't do a 100% trim because if you're clamping on the perimeter material outside the part, if you cut it completely free, your, your final piece that you need to keep is no longer restrained and very unlikely that it won't come loose and get into the bit and get ruined. And so what's commonly done is people leave tabs. You can program this in most CAM software where you have specific places around the perimeter where the bit essentially skips over and leaves a small connecting piece of material so that the clamps on the outside are still able to transfer their holding force to the piece you're cutting in the middle. If you do that, you can lay the piece on, clamp at the outside, drill and trim all at once, but then you'll still have to go back and manually cut the tabs with pliers and you'll have to clean up those nubs along the edge because you won't have a perfectly clean trim. I have some parts that I drill and trim with tabs in one operation. I have some parts that I drill in one operation, refixture and trim complete in one operation. It just depends on what the part is, how big it is, and how the fixture is going to work. Hello, Ben Miller. Thank you for coming by. Clark Tro says he's been thinking about trying to do a hybrid system where he's got some clamps and some vacuum. This is the other thing that's very commonly used in plastics fixturing for parts trimming is vacuum. And the kind of vacuum that's used for fixturing parts is often very different from the kind of vacuum we use for forming parts. So you know if you have a vacuum pump, you have two rating systems. You have CFM and then you have inches of mercury. CFM refers to how much volume of air the pump can evacuate and the speed at which it can do that. 
and then inches of mercury describe the total maximum pressure that can be achieved, the total maximum vacuum that the pump can produce. And usually there's an inverse correlation. If you have a pump that has very high CFM and can move a lot of air, it's very typical that that kind of pump can't pull a very strong vacuum. If you have a pump, a two-stage pump, that can pull you know, 27 and a half, a true 28 inches of mercury outside of a laboratory, not achievable. So if you say, oh yeah, I pulled 28, 29 inches of mercury, not actually true. Um, if you have a pump that can pull 27 inches of mercury, usually that's a two-stage pump and it has a fairly low CFM rating, usually under 10 CFM for the kinds of, for the kinds of pumps and the dollar amounts that most small holster shops are looking for. If you're spending under $1,000 on a vacuum pump and you're getting 27 inches of mercury out of it, very likely you're dealing with eight or nine CFM or less, okay? Adrian Concealment's in the house. Hello, Seth. For fixturing for CNC trimming, maximum vacuum is not necessarily needed. What you do need, though, is the ability to overcome leaks. And so this is where CFM comes in and is a major player. If you have a pump that can pull 200 CFM, it can move tons of volume. If you get a leak and that leak is allowing 10 CFM of air to flow, the effective vacuum of the pump is not diminished at all by that extra 10 CFM of leak because the pump can move so much volume that it just eats up that 10 CFM of leakage and there's no change in the clamping pressure on the part. If you have a 3 CFM pump and you get a 2 CFM leak, more than 60% of your clamping pressure goes away because the pump can't overcome that amount of leakage. Hello, Tony. And um, there are a few ways to do these kind of parts. So when I was first looking at getting into CNC parts trimming, I had an opportunity through kind of a random series of internet connections to talk with a guy who works in a medical parts and components manufacturing company. And they processed somewhere around 200,000 square feet of plastic a month, which is an insane quantity of material. And they were doing, you know, huge, 10,000, 15,000 parts, huge runs of vacuum formed parts. They built their own formers and they had five axis trimming machines and they were doing vacuum clamping for almost everything because it's so it's it's faster you just lay the part on engage the vacuum there's no clamps there's no screws it's fast um, you had to have larger parts usually um, vacuum is also a function of surface area the smaller your part is the less actual pounds the fewer pounds of force are actually exerted on it so if you tried to vacuum clamp something the size of a nickel or a dime in place no matter how powerful a vacuum you pull, it's not going to exert very much force because the object has such little surface area. If you had a four by eight foot sheet of plastic, you would only need a few pounds per square inch of force to very quickly have a lot of downward pressure on that overall sheet. And this is why vacuum clamping on four by eight foot CNC's is very commonly used in cabinet making, furniture making, sign making, any place where you're working with large and reasonably thick or stiff sheet stock if you have a 14 or 15 inches of mercury vacuum pulled on 32 square feet of material, that's an enormous amount of actual downward pressure on the part. And you can cut it very aggressively and it won't move at all. But if you're going to try to fixture small, thin, flexible, lightweight plastic parts, then you have to have gasketed zones. And you can do that by either having washers with a through hole in the middle which gives you a very small vacuum zone, but it seals pretty well, or you can actually machine a channel in the part and put neoprene, basically neoprene dowel, neoprene rod, um, neoprene tubing in place so that when you vacuum the part down, that neoprene forms a seal and you get a small vacuum zone. It's doable, it's just, it has, it's, it can be complicated to design, and while you're cutting, if your small part flexes and the vacuum seal breaks, almost always you'll end up throwing the part and scrapping the part and it's toast. And so vacuum is like 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 0%. If it works, it's working really well. If it fails, it fails catastrophically when you're clamping stuff, unless you have a pump that can produce 
it can draw large amounts of air. And so it wouldn't work well to simply take your Robin Air pump and move it over to your little CNC and try to use it for vacuum clamping a lot of parts. Water, Mike, not moonshine. Yeah, on a holster, there is not a lot of flat surface area that you can use for gasketed zones. And unless you have a five axis machine, you can't gasket channels that wrap 3D contours in the part. You're basically limited to gasketing pockets on the horizontal surfaces. So you can do it, um, but it's, it's got challenges. Exterior clamp and just enough vacuum to hold down the part for the last bit. So if you're going to try to do that, Clark, my initial reaction to that is the juice is not worth the squeeze. If you're going to go through the hassle of designing a fixture that positions exterior clamps that hold the part well enough for you to do a 98% trim and leave tabs, going through the additional hassle and expense of also making that fixture vacuum compatible with zoned gasketed areas just so that you can do it without tabs and do a full cut that seems like it's not worth it to me. Um, that's my gut. But it also depends on how you're forming your parts. This is the, the other point I wanted to bring up about exterior clamping. If you're going to use toggle clamps or threaded hold down clamps or any other kind of clamp outside the perimeter of your final part, you have to have enough extra material around the perimeter of your holster to actually have something for the clamps to grab onto. In order to do that, usually you're going to end up forming holsters as singles or doubles in order to have in order to have gasket material around the outside edge after your forming process. If you're doing a very tightly nested vacuum array, like if I've got six or eight molds on my big vacuum former and they are edge to edge, so that there's once I trim them apart, I pre-cut them for CNC, there's no extra material outside the perimeter of the part, exterior clamping is is unachievable in that in that case. And I would have to sacrifice all the efficiency of nesting the parts to gain back a little bit of efficiency in trimming the parts by having material, which I would be then throwing away, having material outside the perimeter that I could then clamp on. So um, it really, it, there is no one perfect solution. It depends, are you doing outside the waistband or inside the waistband? Do you have a lot of holes drilled through the part? How complicated is the trimming? Do you have to use more than one tool? There are a lot of other factors. I can't perfectly answer the setup generically, but I have some setups that use three or four tools to trim and drill. I have some setups that use one tool to, trill, to, to drill and trim. Um, I have some setups that I trim uh, and drill all at once with tabs and some that I do in multiple steps with multiple operations and more than one fixturing step. It just depends on what your, what is the best solution for that particular part that you're making. One other thing to consider is spindle downtime and table usage. So, um, an optimal workflow coming off of my large vacuum former would be to have a two by two foot sheet of plastic with you know eight holsters in it, get lifted off the vacuum former entire, and without any pre pre-drilling or trimming or anything necessary, set that entire piece on a CNC and have the CNC come in and drill all the holes in all the parts and then trim them, leaving tabs so they're all still connected, in one operation. One pass, cookie cutter all the parts, not have to pre-cut any of them. It's possible, it's doable, but it requires you to have a fixture array and a molding array that are perfectly matched so that when you line the parts up on the CNC they're perfectly aligned and the machine knows where they are because if you drill holes in the wrong place and then profile cut in the wrong place all you've done is ruin parts and that requires you to have a certain minimum pass-through gap between parts based on the diameter of your bit and it requires you to have your mold layout be all done with indicators or pins or have the entire mold be machined as one monolithic piece. And if you want to do modular molds or mix and match what's in the forming machine, then you can't do a gang style trimming fixture. The other cost of a gang style trimming fixture is if you have a huge piece on your CNC machine and you trim it, 
if you have a huge piece on your CNC and you trim it, when you're done trimming, then you have cleanup. Okay? You have, you have to unfasten the clamps, lift the piece off, vacuum up all the chips, make sure everything's set, put the next piece on. And if, you are, if your fixture stays on the machine and you load, you unload, clean, and reload parts on the same fixture, then all that time, all that unload, reload time, is not cutting time. The machine's just waiting on you. The way that you can get around that is some kind of pallet system. If you have the ability to have interchangeable fixtures that can swap onto the machine so that you can load parts on one fixture and then quickly take the existing fixture off, put the next fixture on, and not have to put in all the machine screws or do all the actual attaching of individual parts, but just change out sections and then go, if you can keep the actual mach the CNC machine cutting for more time per hour, you're getting more parts at the end of the day. The bigger the mold array, the smaller the margin of error in fixture. It's slightly off. Significant variations can occur across the sheet of parts. Yes, this is the other cost of large gang molds. Okay, if you're shifted off, if you're rotated off your work axes uh, a degree at your origin at your center or your corner, if you're referencing a corner, you're going to be very close. By the time you get to the other corner of a 24 by 24 inch piece, you're going to be far enough off that the pieces are probably scrap. And so consistency in fixturing is equally, in some cases, more important than time efficiency in fixturing. It doesn't matter how fast you go, if the parts are ruined when you're done and you can't use them, it was for nothing. And so um, I have a router that could handle two by two foot pieces and I have a mill that cannot handle two by two foot pieces. My brother Speedio 700 does not have 24 inches of Z travel, uh, sorry, Y travel, Y axis travel. So I can't take entire sheets out the vacuum former and put them in the brother. And so the way I skin that cat is I quarter up or cut into six pieces or eight depending on what I'm making the sheet off the side quickly on a bandsaw, just zip it into sections, and then each one of those gets put on a pallet, and I have a pallet system in the mill, so I can quickly swap in and out sets of parts and not have the machine sit and wait long for me while I take out all the individual parts and then put the next set of parts onto the same fixture. Yes, is JR low, but I want to go fast. You, this is the same thing when you're doing the manual processes in holster making. Speed and accuracy are always in tension. The faster you go, the more likely you are to make mistakes, to cut on the wrong side of the line, to have your drill bit wander and have your holes not line up. The faster you go, the more likely you are to catch a piece on the buffing wheel and throw it or gouge it. You know, there, there is always a cost to speed. Depending on what you're making and your overall level of skill, the, the cost may be acceptable. You might want to go faster at the risk of scrapping four or five parts per hour, but it may not be worth it. It depends on what you're making, how much faster you can actually go, and then how much more likely you are to ruin parts by going that fast. So these, these are all trade-offs that every individual shop has to keep track of. My brother Mill can drill and trim very, very quickly. I don't use all of the speed it has available. I, I'm, not, I'm not trimming holster shells at 380 inches a minute. I could, the machine's capable of doing it, but I would get terrible edge finish. The parts would not be nice afterwards. It wouldn't matter how fast I went on the machine, if the product is bad at the end, the speed is for nothing. And the place where I find sort of the break-even point on speed for me, if I'm using a pallet system, say I'm cutting um, my Glock 17 holsters and I've got two on the machine. If it takes me 45 seconds to take one set of trimmed shells off a pallet and put the next set of untrimmed shells on the pallet and put in the machine screws to hold them down and get it ready to go in the machine, if that takes 45 seconds, there is no reason at all to push the speeds and feeds on my machine so that it's done in 20 seconds 
if all that means is then that it's going to sit idle for 25 seconds until I'm done with the next set of parts. And so I'm always on whatever set of parts I'm trimming, trying to find the balance using a palette system of what is the most time, what's the amount of time I need to actually make the changeover on the work table outside the machine to get the last set of parts off and the next set of parts on the pallet. If that takes a minute and 40 seconds, then I will adjust the cutting cycle so it's about a minute and 40 seconds. If that means I slow down the cutting and get an even better edge finish off the parts, fantastic. There's no advantage to me going faster if it just means the machine's going to sit. However, if you're not using a pallet system, if you've only got one fixture and it's on the machine and it stays on the machine, and while it's cutting, you're just standing there with the next uncut part in your hand waiting for it to finish, and then as soon as it's done, you have to shop back the chips up and take the screws out and pull that part and put the next one on, then you can't afford to go really slow and get a nice clean trim because that's dead time for you. And so that trade-off is significant. And you'll want to find a way using your machine, using the available area that it has to work with, to get the maximum time and quality efficiency out of your process. One way to skin that cat is if you're trimming individual holsters, if you can set up two identical side-by-side -side trimming stations, so while it's cutting on the A fixture, you're loading the B fixture. It finishes A, you call up a separate program, run it, and it cuts on B while you unload and reload A. If you can do that, and you can have shared table time where you're fixturing and it's cutting alongside you, as long as you can do that safely, then that's a way to keep the spindle engaged almost all the time and be engaged in fixturing almost all the time. That's an efficient way to do it. Some large uh, CNC routers like Onsrud routers, um, they actually have interchangeable tables, you know, where you'll have two five by six foot or five by eight foot tables, and the cutter head moves over and runs all the parts on table A while table B is retracted out of the machine and you can access it as the operator, and then you change tables and table B goes in, table A comes out, and you unload and reload. That's a crazy amount of efficiency, but if you have enough parts to fit on a table and you can, and those cycle times, the cycle and fixture times match, then that's unbelievable efficiency. The hurrieder I go, the behinder I get, says John Keller. Yeah, that's true of all kinds of things. Speed is not free. Speed is always paid for. Speed is paid for in lost parts. Speed is paid for in stress to you. Speed can be paid for in broken or worn out tools. Speed can be paid for in injuries to yourself. Speed can be paid for in a lot of ways. Speed is never free. Okay? There's almost never a case where in your shop you can make something go twice as fast as it used to go without there being some other trade-off in some other portion of the process. So what if you trim your parts at 250 inches a minute? You're just screaming through parts on the CNC, but the edge finish looks like you did it with a chainsaw. Well, every 30 seconds of cycle time you saved, you're going to have to pay back in sanding time. Where do you want to spend that time? Okay. That's a question that you have to answer based on your equipment, your skill, your CNC, your programming chops, what you're making, and what your quality standards are. If you're not picky about your edges, go as fast as you can, sand quickly, and call it a day. If you're picky about your edges and you want them to be glossy, then usually trim slower, buff carefully, and give up time to get the quality you want. So that's fixturing. There's a lot of variables. There are many different ways to do it. And there are even many tweaks you can make in the programming. Generally, when your machine's cutting in straight lines, you get pretty nice, clean surface finishes on your edges. Anytime you're going through contours in the part or you're going around corners in the part, that's when you're most likely to have issues. Bit selection here is huge. If you're trimming thin, flexible parts, nice painting, says Stephen Baker. I agree. This is a David Baker original, Stephen's brother. Um, 
If you're trimming a lot of parts, down spiral, left hand helix, O flute bits from Ansrud or Amana are a huge help. If you have up cut bits and they're trying to lift chips out of the cut, they're also trying to lift your flexible part off the fixture and you'll get chattering, you'll get a lousy edge finish, lousy surface finish on your edge. Um, so bit selection is important, RPM is important, some materials like higher speeds, some like lower speeds. The, the, the speed at which you feed the bit through the machine is dependent on the thickness of the material, the rigidity and security of your fixturing, but also how rigid your machine is. If you have a little desktop machine that's built out of a little bit of aluminum, a little bit of plastic, and a little bit of MDF, that thing is not rigid enough to take hard corners at 125 inches a minute and not get shaky. So you have to, you gotta drive the car you have. You have to use the CNC you've got most effectively. For some guys, that means really pushing the speeds. For some guys, it means dialing the speeds back. Um, so that's some basic info on fixturing. Now, when should a shop get into CNC? What do you need to have to make the leap into CNC? And how can you get there if you're not there yet, but you want to be there? Uh, the first thing that you need to get into if, you're into, if you want to get into CNC, you have to have time. And this is probably the single most difficult part, far more than money, is time. And not a bare minimum of time to get sort of over the hurdle and get sort of operational, but you need to have enough time to continue to learn, to continue to understand, to continue to challenge yourself, and to learn to do it right. Because CNC can be a tremendous headache and an enormous money pit if you don't have time to do it well. Hello, Corey Knowles. Glad to see you here. Um, so if you don't have time, you won't learn, you won't be able to learn CNC. If you can't set aside hundreds of hours, you won't learn CNC well. And doing CNC halfway is a recipe for hair pulling and alcoholism. Sort of facetiously, but not really. If, if you try to make the leap to the next level, but you only leap halfway, you end up in the crevice in between. And what that means is you've invested a bunch of time up front and you've invested money. You bought a CNC, you bought software, but you're not at the point where it's actually increasing your productivity. It's just a money and time suck. That's a horrible place to be. So count the cost, okay? Uh, the Bible talks about a guy who tries to build a house and doesn't count the cost before he starts to figure out if he's got enough cash to finish it. It says that guy's an idiot. If he starts the job not knowing whether or not he's got the resources to finish the job, he's a fool. So be sober and self-critical about trying to make the jump into CNC. It is not all like, you know, unicorns and clouds and fluffy happy things. CNC is hard work. It's uh, it's got a lot of lingo, it's got a lot of there's a lot of G code to learn, there's a lot of a lot of ins and outs of software, a lot of quirks, a lot of fixturing, there's a lot of money to be spent. And there's not really a safety net. You can crash and ruin a machine. So I'm not saying that to discourage I'm not saying that to discourage you from considering it, but to discourage you from considering it in a best case scenario kind of mindset. Uh, manufacturing is not a place for rose, rosy optimistic thinking in terms of costs, time frames, and obstacles. If you go in, if you convince yourself to pursue something based on a best case scenario estimation of it, you are going to end up missing your estimate. You're gonna end up behind on time, over on budget, over on time costs. You're never gonna hit that number that you had, that idealized best case scenario number. And so before you buy a machine, get a seat of software. 
and set aside all the time you can to learn it. If you can set aside two hours a night, learn really fast. If you can only set aside two hours a week or an hour a week, you know, do YouTube tutorials, build parts that have nothing to do with holsters, learn how the CAM system and CAD system work, learn all the different features and functions and tools that are in your ribbon in the CAD software. Just do stuff with it. Learn to drive it. J.R. Lowe says, I don't have a large amount of time to invest in learning it all at once. That's why I went with the 3D printer and started learning the design part of it and I hire someone to do the machine work. Okay, that's one way to solve it. Um, but also, some people just aren't built for CNC, and I think Clark pointed this out a minute ago. Some people do not have the ability to think in a systematic, um, in a systematic way about how to do CNC well. Some people just like it just doesn't never clicks for them. If you're not a person who CNC is clicking for, um, it may be better for you to find somebody else to do it for you, to pay somebody to come into your shop and do it for you, or to outsource it. Okay. If you find, if you try it for a while, if you get the get the software and you work with it, and you find you're just not good at it, you don't have the aptitude for it, don't spend the next year or two trying to compensate and be good at a thing you're not good at. Just, you know, fish or cut bait, cut bait, find somebody who is good at it, and pay them a good wage to do it right quickly the first time for you. This is one of the things I found that was very interesting when I started first offering uh, tooling solutions for other holster companies, is that a number of the companies that I started working with either already had their own CNC in-house or had several times gone to general job shop, machine shop style operations to get aluminum molds made, to get jigs and fixtures built, to get tooling made. And uh, what I found is in the case where a holster maker doesn't have CNC experience himself and he's talking to a machinist who doesn't have any holster experience or firearm experience, that so much gets lost in translation there that what ends up happening is the, C the holster maker spends a bunch of money and ends up with a holster mold that doesn't work. And it's made exactly to the spec that he and the, and the tool maker agreed upon, but the tool maker didn't understand the function of the end product intuitively because he'd never used one. And he had no ability to troubleshoot the design before it was executed, to make recommendations based on how the tool, the mold, was going to be used and so you could end up with a lot of time and a lot of money invested and have almost nothing at the end because everything got lost in the middle. And so what I found, and I think this is one of the major values, one of the enormous um, values that mold makers like myself or Conrad Miller offer to holster companies, is we're not primarily machinists who have found a market doing holster molds. We are holster makers who have stepped up into the machining and mold making market, which means we have a thorough and detailed understanding of the function and fit and finish requirements of the final product. We've used them extensively. We've designed lots of holsters. We've looked at lots of holsters. We're familiar with the hardware on the market. We're familiar with the screws and the posts and the spacers. We're familiar with soft loops and foamies and paddles. We understand the variations in SIGs and H and Ks. We know all the guns in the Glock family by number and caliber. Like we have the depth of knowledge to come in and not only machine parts, but design molds that do what they're supposed to do the right way the first time. And that's huge. Hello, Dave Pryor. Uh, when it comes to buying a machine versus outsourcing tooling costs, um, if you want to get into CNC, here are some shops that I think should get into CNC. If you're really, really hungry for creative control and you want to have the ability to control the design in real time, make revisions and changes and prototype and test a lot, then you want in-house CNC. You don't want to be paying for 
change order work every time you want to make a slight revision and have a new tool cut. So if you have a lot of ideas, if you're interested in prototyping, if you're working on unusual applications or unusual products that are going to require a lot of testing and a lot of revisions, then having in-house CNC makes sense. If you have seem to have a natural aptitude for it, you get the software and it just clicks with you. Like this is the way you think. CNC makes sense to you. Then having your own CNC makes sense. If if you have a pretty well established line of products, you're not prototyping a lot of new stuff, you're not trying to make a lot of changes, you just want to find a way to make what you already make faster with fewer quality control issues and make it cleaner, then it's probably worth it for you to outsource the tool making so that you minimize the time investment you have to make to get to that next production level. Because if you can get a custom aluminum tool made in a couple of weeks, that's a lot less time and a lot less effort than learning CNC yourself and sitting down with calipers and angle gauges and radius gauges and, and doing CAD from scratch and then testing and revising and playing with molds. Like that's, if you have a discrete thing you want and you can have somebody make it for you and it'll work and you can get back to making the thing, then outsourcing it makes a ton of sense in that kind of, that kind of situation. Um, even if you have your own CNC, there may be some points at which you play with an idea, you prototype it, you make some test molds, and then when it comes to making the real deal production tooling, you outsource that step because maybe your machine isn't able to make quality enough tooling. It doesn't have the rigidity or the torque to really do what you need to do and make the molds you need to make. You know, I used to make all my molds on my little CNC router. I never make any molds of any kind on my CNC router for anything anymore ever because I have a mill. And the, the quality of the molds I make on the mill so smokes the quality of the best molds I made on my small CNC that there's no comparison. And so if you want the best quality tooling that you can get, then making it yourself with a $1,000 desktop router those two don't match up. Joining late says Todd May. Yeah, Todd, you really are. Glad you made it, but yeah, totally late. Um, John says I read his mind. It's true. I can't believe some of the things that I read. I just can't believe in your mind. Now, this is the point I made earlier about having a mold maker who is first a holster maker and second a mold maker. Um, when it comes to designing an appendix holster, if you have a holster maker who understands appendix rigs, who understands the concealment challenges, the access challenges, the safety issues, the different kinds of options that are on the market to improve concealment, you know, if, if, if you have a mold maker who understands appendix carry intimately, he's going to do a better job designing a mold for you than a guy who's like, appendix carry? Isn't your appendix an organ? What are you carrying? Okay. And so in any field, if you have a person who understands the end use and the end product in a thorough way, they're going to be able to do a better job of making the tools and fixtures and jigs and the things to get you there because they also understand where you're going. They're not just relying on you trying to explain to them where you're going. Um, if you want to get into CNC and you don't feel you're ready for it, you either don't have the capital to buy a machine, you don't have any experience with the software, or you don't have enough volume of sales. If you're selling five to ten holsters a month, that doesn't mean you can't get into CNC, but at that kind of sales volume, nothing about your current business requires CNC. Hello, Aaron Walker. Um, if you're making five to ten holsters a month, you can do that in one day a month with a coffee bum press, easily, and a couple of multi-molds, no problem. If you're trying to push 900 units a month, you can't do that as effectively with a foam press and a couple of multi-molds. 
if you're trying to move 9,000 units a month, there's no way without getting into industrial processes. And so the, some people want CNC and don't need it. Some people need CNC and don't really want it because they're suspicious of it or, or feel like it would just make their holsters into cookie cutters. And this is another misconception that I want to I wanna crush, okay? There is as much creativity, intelligence, intentionality, and detail-oriented design work in CNC holster making is, as there is in making every one a one-off, all-by-hand, unique snowflake of a holster. The difference is the consistency with which we can execute. Okay? If I spend two months working through a design and I make dozens of prototypes and I send out 20 test holsters and get feedback from a bunch of different users, okay, and I end up refining all the features and function of that holster and then finally producing a production version of it for sale, I am confident that with that level of investment of time and energy and intentionality that I will produce a better holster that conceals better, fits better, draws cleaner than virtually anybody I know in the Codex holster industry can possibly do in one shot by hand with a foam press. Okay. I hate the cookie cutter comments, says J.R. Lowe. And as a mold maker, I'm biased on this because I sell molds. And the place where we see the, the cookie cutter comments, every time there's an advancement in mold availability, in mold options, when guys started using multi-molds, I heard cookie cutter comments like, oh, that's pre-blocked. Everyone's stuff's going to look the same. Last I checked, no multi-mold and no DIY drone ever came perfectly set up for the holster I wanted to make, which meant I was always modifying them, which meant mine were always different from every other Joe who was using the exact same DIY drone. And, and what John just said about, uh, about creativity and actually achieving the design you were always striving for If you're 100% satisfied with the product you make on a foam press, I'm happy for you, but I think you're missing something. If you are completely content with the production speed, efficiency, and quality of your existing process, whatever it is, if you're 100% happy with it, then I think you've missed something. Because the industry is changing, new guns are coming on the market, tactics and training are changing, new and better ways of doing things are being tested and refined, which means we're not setting anything in stone. Okay? 10 years ago, when I started making holsters, I thought appendix carry was crazy. I was like, oh man, I'm making strong side hybrids. That appendix stuff is nuts. Now, I basically only make appendix holsters. And it's not because I decided to sacrifice my principles and go where the money was. Because I think the appendix market is still a fairly small slice of the overall holster market. Hello, Gundo. No, Aaron Walker, that's not true. It's not true. I'm not, pff, no. Anyway, um, if you're not hungry for an even better product, for an even better process, for an even better whatever it is you're making, if you're not hungry, if you're satisfied, then I think you stop striving, you stop pushing, you stop growing. I'm not satisfied. I'm very hungry, which, you know, in some ways is stupid because I've spent a lot of time, a lot of money, a huge amount of energy developing the process I currently have and it works really well, but I'm still tinkering. 
I'm still tweaking things in CAD. I'm still playing with things in CAM. I'm still trying new fixturing ideas. You know, in the past few weeks, I've been playing a lot with matched mold die pressing. And that's very interesting tech. I know a number of other holster companies, bigger companies than me, are already doing it very successfully. Some are doing it differently than others, that there's no one single way of doing matched mold or die forming. But for certain kinds of products, it offers clear advantages over vacuum forming. It has trade-offs in terms of time. It, there, you know, Every process has trade-offs. But I'm still hungry. I'm still investigating. I'm still investing time and energy trying to learn new ways of doing things. What did Mike Jolly say? Turning down a holster business due to not having the available CNC molds for the gun models, but I make it a point to push the fact the reason for the molds I'm using is that the fit and function is precise and excellent. Customers end up purchasing holsters to replace the holsters they already own. I am a big believer in quality. Um, I have never been a fan of trying to drive holster sales by being the budget option on the market. That's never been my niche. I don't think it's a good niche. Um, I think uh, bottom dollar basement pricing uh, makes sense if you are injection molding kids' lawn chairs in China for sale through Walmart. If you are making life-saving gear that needs to perform in the most stressful situations in a person's life, then, what was that joke? It was an Armageddon. You know, Steve Buscemi says, just think, you're sitting on a, a, you know, in a spacecraft with 250,000 parts built by the lowest bidder. Great. A banana holster, says Aaron Walker. What can I say, Aaron? I hate bananas. I'm never going to make a banana holster. I can't stand bananas. So if you, if you want creative control, if you have time and not a lot of money, Get software and start learning CAD because you can do that for cheap or free. Um, you, if, you have, if you have already or are expecting to have a high volume of orders and you need a more efficient, consistent process than you can currently hack by hand, then CNC is probably the way to go. Or outsourcing. You may be able to find another shop. I'm one, but there are others who offer the ability to have you design and spec parts, which then they will vacuum form, trim, and send to you. Um, that's a way to quickly scale up your production ability, your production volume, without having to invest a lot of money in learning, a lot of money in new equipment, and a lot of money in new space. So uh, there may be a CNC part three I'm going to go through as usual. I'll go through all the comments after this and try to answer any questions I didn't get to in the actual broadcast. Um, if there are particular topics that you have not heard covered about CNC in part one or this part two that you have questions about, it would be very helpful to me if before I sign off in about five minutes, if you would post even a general topical question like, what about end mills or what about dust collection or what about whatever, you know, whatever it is that you still have questions about, that'll help me know if I've got enough material in the near future to punch out CNC part three or if I need to wait a couple months and let some other things percolate and have, you know, as more guys get into CNC and have more questions, then come back and revisit CNC in a couple, uh, a couple of months. So if you have any questions related to CNC and holster applications, please post them up here so I can make sure to see them and follow them up. Um, CNC has totally changed the way that I do everything in my shop and I love it. I'm so glad I made that jump. It has freed me up to design things, knowing that I have the ability to incrementally, carefully, in a measured way, dial in until I'm exactly where I want, where the hand building, hand modifying mold process was always hard to quantify. I was never dealing with precise measurements. I couldn't go back and check things. If a mold got damaged or broken, it was basically it was just gone. You know? And so I also, like when I'm doing CNC, if I have an idea how I want the thing to function, but I'm not exactly sure exactly how the mold should be shaped to make the thing fit the way that I want, guess what I do? I make five different versions 
or three different versions. You know, I can actually do, you know, what, you know, this gun has a particularly sharp trigger guard and I find that just a little bit too deep in the trigger guard and all of a sudden the retention's way too high. You know, exactly how much retention do I want? You know what I can do? I can make five molds with differences in trigger guard dimple depth of, you know, it, with increments of 10 thousandths of an inch. And then make holsters on each one and say, okay, you know, 60 thou is too deep, 50 thou too deep, 45 thou pretty good, 40 thou pretty good, 35 thou too light, 30 thou way too light. You know, it's going to be somewhere in like that 45, 47, 48 thou range. And I can actually dial it in and test it and then go back and make another version of the older thing to compare. It's a much more quantifiable process but that costs time and energy. And time and energy is money. Any amount of time I spend prototyping something that I'm not getting paid for right away is time I'm taking away from paid orders that I could have done today instead of next week. And so you've got to find the balance for your business. If you have, you know, say you have the opportunity to get a huge purchase order for 2,000 identical units, you know, that's an ideal application for a custom CNC mold. You need to make 2,000 of something, you need to make it in a very specific time frame, and they've got to be identical. That's a no-brainer. Get a CNC mold made. If you're making a smattering of a lot of different things, then making the jump into CNC might not make a lot of sense because there's a certain amount of cost of time and energy to get any gun model operational. If you want to go full CNC mold and then vacuum form and you want to CNC drill and trim, there's a lot of moving parts in there. That doesn't happen fast. So that's CNC part two. I covered fixturing and some things to think about if you don't have CNC and want to get into CNC. Um, if you have any other questions or comments about CNC and holster making, please post them up here. I'm going to take a second and just scroll back through some of the comments and see if there's anything else I need to answer right now, and then I'm going to sign off because I am whipped. It has been a long week. I was sick for a couple days. And then since I've been feeling better, I've been scrambling trying to catch up. So I am beat. So if you have any questions, post them up. I do recommend, I recommend Fusion 360. Coulter, I recommend Autodesk Fusion 360. Jared, I do not recommend SolidWorks. Um, Fusion 360 is for the kind of stuff we're doing easily as capable for what we need as SolidWorks is at 300 you know, if you if you're a small business Fusion 360 is free SolidWorks is expensive so there's no point paying thousands of dollars for a license for SolidWorks in order to have access for tons of features you'll never use to make holster molds so hands down nothing else comes close not Rhino Cam not Aspire not anything from Vectric, not Cut 2D, Cut 3D, none of that. Not SolidWorks, not Creo. None of those come close to what Fusion 360 offers for the price that it's at for small businesses. So I can't imagine why anybody would want to go with anything else. Um, and what Fusion 360 offers is integrated CAD and CAM. And it's the same CAM kernel that you're going to be using if you pay for an expensive seat of HSM works to use in SolidWorks, or you get Inventor HSM, um, you're getting the same cam in Fusion 360. It's unbelievably powerful. So, Fusion 360. Uh, Todd May wants, yeah, Coulter says Master Cam in SolidWorks. Yeah, so. If, if you're a holster maker and you're getting into CNC to enable your holster making process to go more effectively, then you don't need Mastercam. Mastercam is thousands and thousands of dollars per seat, and it's designed for heavy machining applications. And even there, on a lot of, a lot of stuff, Fusion 360 and the cam that's in an inventor cam is, is going to be comparable. It's going to do a really good job. It's not that uh, Fusion 360 is a joke and Mastercam is the real deal, but if you have a huge job shop and you handle tons of different kind of stuff 
and you need fourth axis indexers or you need three plus two, you're doing five axis continuous, then yeah, you need Mastercam. But I don't need Mastercam. And so there's no reason for me to spend $10,000 on a seat of Mastercam. Yeah, that's, that's true, Clark. Fusion 360 does have some bugs. Back up your files. Just basic computer literacy, literacy stuff. Um, save often and have backups. It can get buggy. Hello, Shelly Connell. Glad to see you here. Um, tool selection. Um, I don't have any use for high speed tool, uh, high speed steel tools. That's primarily for low RPM things like bridge port mills, stuff that tops out at five or six k RPM. Uh, for use with a router or with a mill that can go eight, 10, 12, 15 k RPM, you want carbide. If you're trimming parts, you probably want down spiral bits. Um, I use a lot of Onsrud Super O series, so one flute, down spiral, so it's pushing the chips down, it's pushing the part down so it doesn't lift and chatter on the fixture. For mold making, I use a lot of three flute cutters that are designed for aluminum. I also use them in plastic. I sometimes use two or one flute cutters for plastic, uh, but for me it's easier to just use a lot of three flute cutters because it's redundant. I can use them in plastic and program the part and then dial back my feeds and speeds and cut the same thing in aluminum on my mill and have not have to change out all the cutters for it. Um, buy good tools. Don't, you know, don't, don't buy generic junky carbide off eBay. There is some good carbide on eBay, but generally if you buy name brand stuff, you're going to get, you're going to get a more known quantity. So, um, for beater generic stuff, I use a lot of AccuPro from MSC Direct. For quality, for, you know, for mold making and things, I use a lot of Destiny Tool. I use Swift Carb. I use GAR. Um, I've got some Goering tooling, mostly carbide drills. Um, I use Mitsubishi Indexables and Corloy Indexables for milling. Um, for router applications, for router table applications, I really like Amana tool. I have a number of Amana bits, bearing bits, top and bottom, and I like them a lot. Have I used Helical? Yes, I have some data flute. I have a bunch of um, some data flute. I have some Helical solutions. Most of the Helical solution end mills I have were given to me, and they are four, five flute stuff, primarily for steel, which I don't do very much of. So I don't have, I have not run much. Uh, from Helical Solutions. But for aluminum, I really like Swift Carb. I like Destiny Tool. AccuPro does fine. Data Flute's pretty good. GAR is pretty awesome. Um, you know, for the kind of fairly light applications I'm doing where I'm not putting a 200 pound block of aluminum on the machine and, you know, m milling away 90% of it, 95% of its weight. For the, for small holster molds, you know, Tooling is not that critical. It's not that, you know, if I had a part that had a 10 hour runtime and changing the tooling to a more aggressive tool or better quality tool would shave two hours off my runtime, amazing. But if I've got a 20 minute part, you know, there's, there's just not a lot of fat there to trim oftentimes. Love on suits, says John Keller. I've been using them for about 18 years on multicam CNC routers. Let this man get some rest. Yeah, I'm pretty beat. Um, I really like Onsrud. And one of the reasons I like Onsrud is Onsrud doesn't only sell cutters, they also sell really amazing CNC routers. If you've not looked at Onsrud, they're phenomenal. They're expensive. A four, like their 4 by 8 foot router system, it's about 100K. It's more than my mill. Um, but if you have an application that needs like two shifts a day or three shifts a day, seven days a week, and you've got to have that router running all the time. Like if you need an industrial quality, heavy duty router, Onsrud's amazing. And you can cut at very high speeds too. Um, so I would love an Onsrud router, but it's not in the cards. Like for what I'm doing, it's, it's essentially like cutting paper when it comes to trimming Kydex. An Onsrud router is ridiculous overkill for trimming Kydex. Um, routers that I do think are worth looking at, uh, the the, the first two are Shop Saber and Cam Master. 
I also think that uh, ShopBot has some good options. Um, Velox CNC has some good budget options. Uh, other ones guys use Probotics, Shapeoko, um, and then there are a whole bunch of small sort of DIY kit style benchtop machines. And really you are getting what you pay for. You'll get a lightweight machine that's not very rigid, that can't cut very fast, uh, that uses a pretty inexpensive cutter head and spindle head. And if you have a machine that's not rigid, you know, there's only so much, you won't really be able to realize the benefit of top, at, top flight tooling. You know, the difference between a piece of junk cutter and an amazing cutter in my mill is very apparent. It's like good tires versus garbage tires on a Ferrari. You'll feel the difference. But if you've got a Geo Metro and you're going 25 miles an hour, junk tires versus amazing tires makes little difference. So, you know, in as much as you have the equipment to effectively use the tools, spend money on the best tools you can get. And then don't crash them and break them. You know, if I'm making a new part, I'm not sure how it's going to turn out. I'll be conservative on my feeds and speeds. And also, I'm not going to put my very best tools in for run one. You know, I'm not going to put, I'm not going to, I'm not going to prototype a new thing with all Swift Carbon Destiny tools loaded up. I might, you know, bust out some of the older used AccuPro stuff and say, okay, Let's dial the feeds back 25% because Swift Carb would be better, but this can't handle that. Dial it back 25%, make a test copy, make sure everything about the toolpath does what I'm expecting. Then I'll put a fresh piece of stock in. I'll swap out a few tools. I'll retouch them off and I'll put in the good stuff and then run it at full speed once I'm sure that the part's not going to crash. You know. So... Uh, I appreciate you spending your Friday evening with me. I'm very thankful for you guys taking the time to come and hear what I have to say. Um, it helps me think through what I'm doing and how I explain my products, my processes. But I also think that I have a lot to be able to contribute to, these, to this industry. And I'm happy to do so. I'm very thankful for the opportunity to share what I do know with you and also learn things from you. So I read these comments carefully. I will go through and read them all tonight and respond to you as I'm best able to. And uh, I hope you guys have a great weekend. That'll be it for me tonight. Thanks, guys.